Okay. Hi, welcome back to Videos from the Ville. I'm Charlie Greenewalt. Uh, I'm Professor Greenewalt, and this is Public Administration, Government 241, uh, Public Administration and Public Service. Today we're going to be looking at organization and organization structure. Find that um, we should start out with the fact that uh, in all of human history, mankind has only been able to develop five basic types of organization. Let's go through those five types of organization so you understand what they are. Now, if we were together in the normal classroom setting, I could be able to draw illustrations of this uh, on a blackboard in back of me, and you would be able to see my um, legendary um, artistic talents. Um, unfortunately, you won't be able to giggle and laugh at those uh, because of our present arrangement, but uh, I'll do my best to try to describe them to you. The first type of organization that mankind has developed is really what we call the leader-follower cluster. Here you have one individual who uh, is um, uh, very um, um, noteworthy, special, um, stands out in many different ways perhaps, and this person uh, is followed by a group of individuals and they take their orders and their cues from their leader. This type of organization is found in many tribal societies, um, many, if you will, primitive societies. Um, it's found in a very um, uh, traditional um, uh, arrangements and caste systems, for example. So the leader-follower cluster, uh, you have one person and there is a group of people that follow them. Now, next um, you would have, oh, um, let's look at um, uh, um, a mosaic organization. Mosaic organization is a number of organizations. I would draw on the board um, rectangles, solid rectangles, and they would be joined in some places uh, at their, um, at their uh, edges. And uh, uh, you find that these organizations um, the, that are loosely connected one with the other uh, this mosaic type of organization would be what we refer to as a confederation. Uh, there are organizations um, with uh, leadership and they're functioning and they join together with other organizations uh, to cooperate with one function or a group of functions or all functions uh, in uh, doing their job. So this is a mosaic. This actually is what we refer to as a confederation today, okay? And then, of course, you have the pyramid, and the pyramid is perhaps the most common form of organization that we think of, uh, simply a pyramid. Yeah, if that's, that's good. A pyramid uh, which um, has many different levels, and subsequent letter, levels of uh, superior, subordinates, superior, subordinates, superior, subordinates. And all orders uh, uh, come from the top down, and all authority comes from the top down. Um, this is a pyramid organization. Uh, it's um, found in both the business world uh, and in the um, government world. So it's found both in the public and the private sectors, uh, the pyramid. And it's the most common form of organization that we know of. And we also have conglomerates. Conglomerates are pyramids that are joined together. This I put a octag I put an octagon uh, generally um, on the um, on the board, and then I divide it uh, into separate pyramids. Uh, this would be, for example, a conglomerate would be Hershey Foods. Hershey Foods is comprised of a number of different pyramids. You have Hershey Chocolate, the biggest pyramid. And then it is joined on the side by York Peppermint Patties, another separate pyramid. Uh, York was purchased by Hershey some years ago. 
and it still runs as a separate company, but it is uh, joined with uh, Hershey uh, Chocolate. You have Corey Kitchen Equipment. You have um, the Licorice Company that's over on Running Pump Road. That is owned by Hershey as well. Uh, let's see, you have Luden's Cough, Cough Drops. That is owned by Hershey. Uh, Friendly as Ice Cream used to be owned by Hershey. And that was part of it. And you find that all these separate pyramids are all joined at the center. And the center would be the Hershey Foods Corporation. Whereas Hershey Chocolate is part of it. And Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, that's another pyramid in that conglomerate. But they're all joined at the center and they're all coordinated and ruled ultimately by the Hershey Chocolate Corporation. So that's the conglomerate organization. Lastly, uh, the fifth and final type of organization that we have is organic. That is a flat, long, flat organization that has generally uh, one or two leaders. Um, it has a limited lifespan normally. Um, it is created for uh, the uh, conduct of one um, function or for one program, and when that is over, it is disbanded. Um, organic organizations, as we say, are very, very flat and don't have levels uh, to them and generally just have one or two leaders, team leaders. So organic organizations are another one. So type of organizations that we have are leader follower cluster, uh, the mosaic, the pyramid, the conglomerate, and organic organizations. That's pretty much it. Okay? All right, let's go on from there. Let's look at the pyramid-shaped organization. Um, a, another name for this uh, that we use frequently uh, is bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. Um, and you find that the father of bureaucracy is Max Weber. Uh, and if you look at your um, PowerPoints as we go along with this presentation, there is a picture of Max Weber uh, on, I believe, the second slide. Uh, the second or third slide, uh, his picture uh, is at the upper right-hand corner of this particular um, slide. Um, so, Max Weber was a German uh, historian sociologist. Uh, he lived between 1864 and 1920, and he was the first one, although there were many people before who recognized uh, bureaucracy and what it was, no one ever wrote it down and uh, pieced it together as he did. And the people that do that always get the credit uh, for having been the, uh, if you will, inventors of it. Um, find that Max Weber tells us that all pyramid-shaped organizations are bureaucracies, whether they are private or whether they are public. Um, now, he talks about the stages of the development of bureaucracy in the West. Um, we find that after the Roman Empire in the West collapses, the Western Roman Empire, what year? In 476 A.D. In 476 A.D., the Western Roman Empire collapses. The Eastern Roman Empire continues all the way until 1453. All the way until 1453. Just a few years shy of Columbus coming to the New World, there was still a Roman Empire um, in the East. So uh, you find that uh, during this period of time from 476 until the Renaissance, you have this period of time that was called the Dark Ages or more appropriately the Middle Ages uh, in um, Western and Central Europe. You find that during this period of time, bureaucracies were emerging uh, throughout the Middle Ages as different rulers um, and princes uh, tried to come up with rational administrative techniques uh, to extend their authority to all the different areas that they were uh, claiming um, uh, claiming uh, was part of their country. Uh, you find that um, bureaucracy simply grew because things needed to be done. Children needed to be educated. Um, commerce needed to have roads to uh, be tr to um, uh, to function. Um, you find that um, courts needed to grow because uh, justice needed to be dispensed. 
So they grew because society needed things to be done. Now, Weber tells us that there were other very important factors, significant factors in the development of bureaucracy, and they would include the development of a moneyed economy. Um, before this time, we used to barter. After Rome collapses, uh, we would barter. I'd trade um, a quart of milk for perhaps a, uh, a pheasant or a duck. Um, we would trade um, a pound of grain for maybe uh, two pounds of carrots or something. But uh, as we developed money again, uh, a moneyed economy, that lent itself to the development of bureaucracy. The growth of education uh, lent itself to the development of bureaucracy. And the growth of science and rationality. These were all things that uh, helped um, bureaucracy develop. Now, Weber does something that other people had thought of as well, but no one, as I said before, took the time to list them and write them all down. Weber does. What are the features of bureaucracy? Weber gives us six features of bureaucracy. He gives us six characteristics of things that, when you put them all together, you have bureaucracy. What are they? I'd like you to memorize them. And I'm asking you to memorize them because there are many different classes that you will use this material and this information in. You'll use it in government, you'll use it in economics, you'll use it in sociology, um, you'll use it in history. So it's useful to commit this to memory. What is a bureaucracy? A bureaucracy is any organization that has, number one, a specialization of labor. Labor performs a specialized functions. Number two, the presence of hierarchy that uh, pyramid with, uh, with uh, levels of superior subordinates, superior subordinates. That's the presence of hierarchy. And the hierarchy is there uh, to show us the following. It's the basis for compensation or remuneration. Uh, the higher you are in the pyramid, the more money you're going to be paid. It's there to show us authority. Again, the highest, higher you are in the pyramid, the more authority you have. It's there to show us privileges Again, the higher that you are on that pyramid, the more privileges you're going to have. And it's there for promotions. Uh, who's going to be promoted and to what level? Where are they in uh, the pyramid? So uh, hierarchy is useful for all those things. What else is present, uh, present in bureaucracy? Well, how about impersonality? Impersonality. Everyone is supposed to be treated the same. And no one is uh, supposed to be singled out for special treatment. Uh, number four, there's a system of rules that the bureaucracy operates by. Uh, number five, promotion and hiring should be based on technical competence. Promotion and hiring should be based on technical competence. And lastly, number six, there will be a um, system of SOPs, of a system of standard operating procedures. Standard operating procedures are simply set of procedures that are there when certain circumstances arise. When certain circumstances arise, then the organization will always do this. For example, prior to the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the United States Navy had in effect a set of standard operating procedures, SOPs, that uh, naval blockades would always be established 50 miles offshore. Just a standard operating procedure, 50 miles find that President Kennedy wanted to change that in the Cuban Missile Crisis to give the Russian and American ships uh, more of a buffer to deal with one another to try to minimize uh, the opportunities for misunderstandings or miscommunication. So he ordered the American naval blockade set at 75 miles, move it back, uh, give uh, everybody more chance, uh, more opportunities to deal with each other. And uh, he gave that order directly after the naval blockade had been set up for two days. He checked on the progress of it, and lo and behold, the Navy had set up the blockade, and where it had been set? Not where the President ordered. The President uh, was disappointed to find out the naval blockade was set up at 50 miles, because the standard operating procedures of the Navy said 50 miles, and that's what had been done. <clears throat> they didn't hear the President, or they disregarded him. But the, the uh, power of the standard operating procedures was so great that they didn't dare deviate from it. Okay, so those are the six features of bureaucracy. 
specialization of labor, presence of hierarchy, impersonality, a system of rules, uh, promotion and hiring based on technical competence, not uh, cronyism, and lastly, a system of SOPs or standard operating procedures. <coughs> now let's take a look at uh, America's bureaucracy and how America's bureaucracy develops because it's um, uh, quite interesting and I want you to know it and it's, it's different than many other countries. I find that our Constitution, of course, was um, written in 1787 in Philadelphia, uh, where our founding fathers uh, had gone to revise the Articles of Confederation, right? But uh, they felt that the Articles of Confederation were so flawed, they could not be revised successfully, so they decided to write a whole new Constitution and use a form of organizing sovereignty uh, that had never been used uh, to base a large country upon. Mm, of course, that's federalism. So, what, uh, uh, what led to the development of America's bureaucracy? Well, number one, the Constitution has no provisions for governmental bureaucracy. But in order to make the Constitution uh, operational, in order to operationalize the Constitution, Washington needed to have organizations. So what organizations did Washington establish? Well, at first he established three, I'm sorry, he established four. He establishes four different bureaucracies. Number one is a Department of War to defend the country because we had just secured uh, our uh, independence from uh, the British Empire. Number two, a Department of State, so hopefully the Department of War didn't have to be used. Department of Stor State would conduct relations with other countries and hopefully keep the country at peace. Number three, a Department of the Treasury so that we could have a national currency that could be managed and they would handle the uh, monies, the finances of the federal government. Number four would be an Attorney General's office to maintain law and order, and the most basic thing that government needs to do, and without it you can't have a country, uh, you can't have a government without uh, law and order. So the Attorney General's office, Ben Franklin was pestering Washington relentlessly about the need for, and it was established two years later, uh, a post office, and eventually the post office would be the fifth and the final uh, of the main bureaucracies that was established at the beginning of the country. So that's the development of America's bureaucracy in terms of the offices. But what kind of government did Washington create? Washington did something very special. Of course, the Cincinnatus of the West. Washington created government of the good. And what he did there is he hired the best educated individuals, uh, the best educated individuals that could be found to work for the government. He didn't hire political allies. Uh, he didn't hire people who were uh, socially connected uh, or people who supposedly had blue blood. Uh, he simply hired people who uh, knew foreign languages, who had taken calculus, who could play the piano, uh, who could write Latin, uh, write and speak Latin and Greek. He simply um, hired the best educated individuals to work for his government, to work in his government. And this was called government of the good or government of the gentleman. Now this is what Washington uses for his first two terms of office, the first eight years. And this is followed by, of course, the term of John Adams, his vice president, who would become our second president. Now remember, Washington is what? Washington isn't allied with either of the main parties at the time. The Federalist Party of John Adams uh, or the Democratic Republican Party of Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, uh, I should say of John Adams and of Alexander Hamilton, although they were rivals, but they were both Federalists. But John Adams was the second president. Um, you find that uh, Adams, when he becomes president for one term, John Adams continues the hiring practices of George Washington. He hires 
the best educated people that he can find for open positions in the federal government. Now, after Washington, who's an independent, essentially belongs to no party, um, as a example to the people, then to show that he is not politically connected to any one faction, you have Washington as an independent, you have Adams as your second president who's a federalist, and our third president, who was Adams' vice president f for a term, was, of course, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is the developer and the leader of the Democratic Republican Party. Thomas Jefferson continues what John Adams had continued from uh, George Washington. They all practice government of the good or government of the gentleman. This practice continued from Washington to Adams to Jefferson, and then it continued down through two terms of James Madison, two terms of James Monroe, and it continued down to one term of John Quincy Adams, John Adams' son. They all practice government of the good or government of the gentleman. Of course, after John Quincy Adams, who's the next president? Well, it's finally Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson changes uh, Washington and changes this practice. Andrew Jackson replaced government of the good or government of the gentleman with a spoil system. He said to the victor belong the spoils. I don't want to work with um, to work with Federalists and Democratic Republicans. Uh, I'm a Democrat. He formed uh, essentially the Democratic Party uh, is formed out of the election of 1824. Uh, you now have the Democratic instead of the uh, Federalist Party and the uh, Democratic Republican Party. Now you'll have the Democratic Party and the Whig Party and uh, Andrew Jackson was the leader of the Democrat Party and he wanted to just hire Democrats. Uh, he said when he was conducting his campaign that if he won and when he went to Washington he would fire everyone in the government and hire all Democrats. He was going to fire everyone. Well when he finally wins the presidency in 1828 and he is inaugurated in 1829 he does not fire everyone. He fires one-fifth. He fires 20 percent of the federal workforce and then he brings into office the spoil system. To the victor belong the spoils. He fires only Democrats for these jobs. So government of the good now has been an abolished and a patronage system has taken its place. Well, the spoil system uh, continues all the way until the assassination of President James Garfield in 1881. President Garfield um, was a very successful Union general in the Civil War. He was beloved and there was great hope and, anticipa and anticipation in the country that he would lead the country to better times and uh, be a very uh, virtuous and successful president. But um, instead this uh, hope and anticipation turned to public outrage uh, at the, um, the assassination of this, what they all consider to be a fine president and a fine man. So this public outrage leads to the development of the Pendleton Act in 1883. Remember Garfield's assassinated in 1881. In 1883 you have the Pendleton Act being placed into existence. And the Pendleton Act abolished the spoil system and replaced it with a merit system or replaced it with the United States Civil Service Commission that now the merit system headed up by the Civil Service Commission, they would try to find the best uh, qualified person for a job through a system of written exams and they would hire them. And the Civil Service Commission continued all the way until 1979. In 1979 the Civil Service Commission is abolished by the Carter administration. Now remember we still have a Civil Service but we do not have a Civil Service Commission. You find that in 1979, Congress passed the U.S. Civil Service Reform Act. The U.S. Civil Service Reform Act. It was thought at this time, eventually, that the United States Civil Service Commission had uh, too many jobs. Their job was to uh, keep politics out of the federal service and to uh, protect those civil servants from political influence or from being politicized or 
uh, political pressure. That was one job. On the other hand, their job is to recommend to the president and to the executive branch ways which they can get more out of their um, employees uh, and ways to um, improve uh, the performance of those employees. So on one hand, they're whispering into the ears of, of uh, management. On the other hand, uh, they're whispering into the ears of labor. Uh, so Jimmy Carter, in what may be his most outstanding uh, piece of work as president, uh, abolished the United States Civil Service Commission and replaced it with the Office of Personnel Manage Management, OPM. And the Office of Personnel Management, or OPM, is where you go now if you want to be hired by the federal government. They are the entity that hires and fires people. And you have the formation of the Merit Systems Protection Board, the MSPB, and they keep politics out of the federal service. Now, if we go on and uh, the, the um, subject of organization, let's look at some other things that have to do with organization. One would be the division of labor. Um, the division of labor is the way that what? The way that the organization, uh, the way that the bureaucracy is organized, the way that bureaucracy is organized. There's four ways that you can organize bureaucracy. One could be place or geographic area that that particular organization has to um, deal with this geographic area. A uh, good example of this would be the Tennessee Valley Authority. The TVA takes care of uh, water control and flooding only in the Tennessee River Valley, so they just deal with that geographic area. Okay, so place or geographic area, that's a, a good example of that. Clientele is the second uh, way that we can organize bureaucracy uh, by clientele. A good example of this would be the Veterans Administration that they look out for um, individuals who have served in the armed services and they try to help uh, take care of their health needs. Another example of this would be um, the uh, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, which was founded in the Department of the Interior. And this particular agency looks after Native um, Americans to see uh, what they need and um, what uh, can be done to make life as, as good as possible on uh, the, uh, the reservations. Um, uh, process is number three. Uh, another way that you can organize bureaucracy is by process. This can be seen, oh, for example, at Hershey Chocolate, by process. The whole company is organized by process. One, when the milk arrives, um, it is unloaded from the tankers, and it is condensed. So there's a process, the condensing process, and that is how Hershey chocolate is organized in the first place. Uh, place. You have the cocoa beans coming in, and they're milled, they're crushed. So you have the milling department. Um, then you have um, longitude. After the everything is mixed together, everything is combined, it's mixed, and it's mixed, and it's mixed. That's longitude. Again, a process. I worked in steel rolls. After the chocolate leaves longitude, it is run through a series of machines uh, where it's poured into what amounts to a sink, and then it's um, uh, run through these uh, rollers, uh, several rollers, and they go up about mm, 10 feet. Uh, about eight feet, I'm sorry, about eight feet in the air, and then there, so that chocolate, thin layer of chocolate is cut off the top roll, and it goes down to the floor beneath and continues to be molded and continues to be manipulated until they have it just right. Process. And lastly, objectives. This is the way the Soviet military had been organized. They were organized by uh, objectives. Um, and uh, one could see that reflected in, in their uh, organizational materials. So objectives such as um, artillery and missiles and so forth, objectives were things that they wanted to uh, operate. Well, span of control is another organizational concept. Span of control simply refers to how many individuals can any one person effectively oversee. And the federal government has a rule of thumb. The rule of thumb is 20 individuals. 
And actually, I think that's perfect because my office in the state senate uh, got to be to the size of, oh, about uh, 26 people. 20 of them were analysts, and those were the people that I oversaw most, uh, <coughs> most uh, intensely and most frequently. <coughs> and uh, 20 people were plenty. Uh, 20 uh, people were plenty to oversee. And I think that uh, rule of thumb by the federal government is very, very on target. So span of control is how many people can a supervisor effectively oversee. Now what you have to realize that if people work with one another, that it's harder for a supervisor to oversee as many that way. Anytime that people work together, there are disagreements, there are conflicts that have to be ironed out, and you as a supervisor is are the one that has to generally do that. So you will find that after a while, uh, that if people work together, you will not be able to effectively supervise 20 people. You'll only be able to effectively supervise maybe 18 or 16 or something of that size. Okay? Well, let's look at line and staff as well. Let's look at line and staff. You find that um, line and staff are two other concepts of organization. Line positions uh, on an um, uh, organizational chart are all the positions that exercise command authority. So line positions exercise command authority. Staff positions are off to the side and they provide advisory services to the line. They provide advisory services to the line. <laughs> Things such as <coughs> intelligence, procurement, um, accounting, uh, legal services. These would all be examples of advisory services. Now, it's significant that we understand line and staff because an understanding of where the different positions are located in an organizational chart is pretty important in order to avoid conflict. You find that there have been trends that have been set recently in this uh, whole idea of line and staff. We find that in the last generation that staff size keeps on increasing larger and larger and larger. And that's one point. And um, find that uh, they are trying to make the job of the line easier. So you keep on getting more and more staff because there's a belief that more needs to be done and the line needs more help. Well, the second current uh, trend of line and staff is that the staff, instead of helping the line frequently, they generate more work for the line. They generate more work through their work. Um, and rather than reducing the workload of the line, they actually increase the workload of the line. That's a second uh, trend in the concepts of line and staff. Uh, one person that is um, a uh, student of bureaucracy and of organizations in general uh, is Warren Bennis. Warren Bennis. Uh, Bennis is spelled B-E-N-N-I-S. B-E-N-N-I-S. There's a picture of him on your uh, PowerPoints. And what you find is that Warren Bennis wants to critique the bureaucratic model. Since bureaucracy is the type of organization that we use most frequently, he wants us to be aware of the uh, advantages, disadvantages, the shortcomings of this particular uh, organizational type. First of all, and Warren Bennis went on to become, for example, the president of the University of Cincinnati. He tells us that the uh, bureaucratic model doesn't allow for personal growth. It doesn't allow for the development of mature personalities. That's number one. Number two, he believes its system of control and authority uh, is hopelessly outdated. Number three, he believes that bureaucracy doesn't provide adequate means for resolving differences and conflicts between the ranks. Uh, number one, two, three, four. Number four, he believes that the full human resources of bureaucracy are never utilized because in a bureaucracy we'll have mistrust, 
we'll have fear of reprisals, and we'll have jealousy. So the full human resources of any bureaucracy will never be realized. Um, he believes that <coughs> the bureaucracy cannot, cannot assimilate new complicated technology, that a bureaucracy cannot assimilate new complicated technology. Uh, a good example of that was I was in the Pennsylvania State Senate when we adopted um, personal computers. And when personal computers came in and uh, all the secretaries were losing their memory typewriters and being given PCs, um, they were not welcome. No one wanted them. They all wanted to keep their memory typewriters. They knew how to use them and they didn't want these new machines that no one knew how to use and didn't trust. So you find that in the Senate we needed to reorganize and we had to have four new offices. We had to have a uh, Senate Democrat and a Senate Republican and a House Democrat and a House Republican uh, offices of uh, computer offices uh, to help those caucuses um, learn about personal computers, know how to use them, and then accept them. Finally, the lack of adaptability. That goes hand in glove with what I was just saying. Another shortcoming of the bureaucratic model, according to Warren Bennis, is the lack of adaptability. Uh, and uh, that fits very well in that example. Well, I told you that there were five organizations that man had developed over time. Uh, we find that there are other organizational types that are being worked on, that are being thought of, that are being theorized about. And I just want to name them so you're familiar with them. I don't expect you to know the definition of them. I don't expect you to be able to um, use these concepts at this point. But in the future, in other advanced um, public administration courses, you'll run into these, um, these particular concepts and you'll hear these terms again. So I want you to at least have heard them coming out of this class. The organizations of the future that people are working with now and are developing are number one is system structure, number two is the task force model, number three is a matrix or matrix organ matrix organization, number four is system four, and number five is federal decentralization. So these are all other organizations of the future. System structure, task force, matrix organization, system four, and federal decentralization. These you'll be reading about in the near future and learning about, I'm sure. So this takes us up, lastly, to organizational pathologies. Uh, this is something that Warren Bennis just talked about. Now let's look a little bit more closely at what all the organizational pathologies are. There are six that stand out and that need to be really zeroed in on. Let's look at these six organizational pathologies. One is persistence, that an organization will continue to do what it was originally set up to do, regardless how things have changed in the world. Number two is cons conservatism. Conservatism in that, again, the organization will uh, not seek to do something different. They'll just continue to do the same thing, and they will try to be as um, basic in doing it as they possibly can. Number three is growth, that all uh, organizations want to grow and they want to grow to um, try to um, preserve and protect their own turf. And that goes along with number four, the territorial imperative. Anytime that any organization in the environment would be threatening uh, what an organization thinks is their job, they're going to respond. They're going to try to protect their, um, their turf. Number five is status. All organizations are constantly seeking better or higher status. I find that under the Thornburg administration, we took uh, the Bureau of Corrections and made it the Department of Corrections. Now, it had full status as a cabinet level agency uh, and was part of the cabinet. Um, the Senate and the House wanted better offices for many of its members, so the east wing of the Capitol was built in the 
end of the uh, 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s. Status. Everybody always wants a nicer office. Everybody always wants a better parking spot. Number six is self-service, and that is that all organizations tend to take care of their own needs first, self-service. They take care of their own needs before they take care of the needs of anyone else, self-service. Um, in other words, it would be great if you want to win a county commissioner race sometime, uh, all you have to do is promise the uh, voters of that county that you're going to have all the county offices open on Saturday morning when you are available. Um, they will be open from uh, 8 or 9 a.m. till noon or till 1 so that you'll be able to do your business with the county in a time when you actually have off and you don't have to take off from work. Meanwhile, the county uh, people that are working on Saturday morning, they can have off on Monday morning or have off on Wednesday morning uh, to compensate for the time. But uh, they uh, normally do not uh, have their offices open on Saturday because they are concerned about their own serving themselves, not you. Okay. Now, what are the costs of this self-service? What are the costs? The costs are, well, we have greater financial costs in society because we have to have larger government operations than we really need. And this is found over and over again. We have more people than we need in government and so forth. So for that, we have to pay more money for it. You have in government an ever-increasing span of control and a decreasing level of accountability. We have increased problems of coordination. We found that when um, the federal government decided to um, close in on uh, the Branch Levitians and David Koresh at Waco, we find that you had real problems of coordination there. You had the local sheriff's office, you had the Texas Rangers, you had the FBI, you had the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, and Tobacco, uh, and you had the Drug Enforcement Administration, all had people there, and who was calling the shots, uh, who was the um, person who was uh, overseeing the whole operation. Well, it turned out that the, we had to go all the way up to the uh, Attorney General of the United States to um, uh, deal with the problems of coordination in that instance. And, of course, she made the wrong decisions, and it was a fiasco what finally happened. Uh, at Waco. Um, fourth and finally, as we establish new agencies, we create new agencies which in a relatively fixed bureaucratic territory that uh, will end up creating a situation where they're on a collision course with one another and they'll butt heads with one another. Uh, certainly when we had the development of the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, you have the DEA butting heads many, many times with the FBI, with the state police, and with local police, uh, who has the authority to, uh, who has first, uh, who should be, have the first uh, uh, opportunity to deal with these situations. Okay? So these are the four major costs that you find with these um, uh, complications or shortcomings uh, dealing with uh, organization, okay? If you have questions about organization, call me, uh, email me, uh, FaceTime me. I'm happy to talk with you, okay? All right, I'll see you next